Before turning it over to Mike, let me make a few introductory remarks to set some context. Uh, for the last couple of years at CGSR, we've hosted approximately quarterly uh, event talks uh, on China-related China subjects. Speakers have addressed uh, the prospects for military confrontation in the South China Sea, the ideological dimension of China-U.S. rivalry, Korea as a factor in China-U.S. competition, China's nuclear energy strategy, China's approach, approach to soft co power competition, China's grand strategy in historical terms, China's approach to nuclear deterrence, China's approach to multi-domain deterrence, China's place in the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, and one especially bold speaker whose topic was getting China right. Now, uh, we've covered a lot of ground, uh, but it turns out that something very important was missing from this, uh, this puzzle, uh, wh whose importance I did not fully appreciate until I read Admiral McDivitt's new book. Uh, and this missing piece is, of course, the focus of today's talk, uh, the place of naval power in China's military strategy and indeed in its grand strategy. Now, Amer in my experience, uh, Americans with at least a passing knowledge of naval history uh, are inclined to think that China's approach to naval power is just a modern version of Alfred Thayer Mahan's sea power strategy, but updated for the 21st century. And thus, I sometimes hear people conjecture that communist China will be no more successful than Imperial Japan in turning a modern Navy into international preeminence. Having read this new book, I'm persuaded that China's emerging capabilities cannot be dismissed so easily and that their consequences may be far reaching. Indeed, I, uh, I think that uh, understanding China's naval strategy is fundament fundamental to understanding its concept of 21st century competition and conflict. Uh, there's no one better equipped to link naval power to strategic thought than Admiral Mike McDivitt. Uh, his his 34-year-long 34 career in the Navy included operational time in the Pacific, four at-sea commands, including command of an aircraft carrier battle group. It included service as director of East Asia policy in the Office of the Secretary of Defense in the George H.W. Bush administration. It included two years at what was then SYNCPAC and is now Indo-Pacific Command as the J-5, that is the Director for Strategy, Plans, and Policy. Uh, and it included uh, the capstone of his career, service as Commandant of the National War College in Washington, D.C. Uh, Mike then joined the Center for Naval Analyses in Alexandria, Virginia, where I had the frequent opportunity to collaborate with him uh, to great benefit to me. Uh, he was there first as a vice president for strategic studies and now as a senior fellow. And he supports CNA in its mission of providing studies and analyses in, for the development of strategy and policy for the United States Navy. Uh, he's uh, uh, an erstwhile Californian, would that be fair to say? Uh, has a bachelor's degree from the University of Southern California, uh, a master's degree in U.S. diplomatic history from Georgetown University. He's also a graduate of the National War College. Before I turn it over to Mike, let me just remind the group of the, the ground rules. Mike, Mike will speak for uh, approximately 30 minutes to, to set out some introductory remarks from the book. That will leave us a good chunk of time for discussion. Uh, I encourage you to join the discussion. To do so, please raise your hand electronically and I'll call upon you. Uh, if you don't know how to do that, um, well, I think at this point, everyone does know how to do that from the WebEx family. Uh, uh, but if you'd rather just uh, have me put the question to Mike, I'm happy to do so. Please send it to me in the chat function. Mike, thank you so much for making the time to do this. Thank you for your leadership on these issues. Over to you. Thanks very Thank much, Brad. Uh, I really appreciate the fact that uh, uh, you have invited me to speak to, to your uh, 
here at uh, CGSR uh, to the many people who are, have signed on to uh, uh, hear about my book. And what I'm intended to do uh, is uh, speak, as Brad suggested, for about uh, 25 or so minutes, and then I'll go into the question and answer. Uh, what I'm going to start with is, is the question that, that often comes up when I'm uh, talking about the book is, why in the world did you do the book? And it really goes back to eight years ago when I was waiting through the uh, English version of Hu Jintao's 2012 work report to the 18th uh, Chinese Communist Party Congress. These things happen every five years. And came across a statement that indicated China should become a maritime great power. Precisely, uh, General Secretary Hu Jintao, who was on the way out the door at this point, uh, informed the approximately 2,200 senior party members in attendance that the party had determined that China should resolutely, quote, resolutely safeguard its maritime rights and interests and build China into a maritime great power. I found this surprising. I believe uh, this is the first time in its long history that a Chinese leader announced that China, a traditional land, a continental power, also aspired to become a maritime great power. Uh, little did I realize at the time that uh, Beijing was already well on the way toward achieving that goal, and I'll get to that in a moment. But first, I want to talk about why does China sincerely believe that it must become a great maritime power, one that should have a world-class Navy? It's important, I think, uh, at the outset to realize that this is not a passing party fancy. This is a central national objective for the uh, Chinese Communist Party. In the book, I explore the following imperatives that have led the leaders of China to conclude that Chinese maritime power is a strategic necessity. First, China's strategic circumstances have changed dramatically over the past 30 years. Since the 1990s, the dramatic growth in China's economy and its dependence on trade, its go-out strategy, have made it clear that its economic well-being depends heavily on trade, which is mainly conducted by ships. Since 2009, it has been the world's largest exporter. And since then, it has been ranked either number one or two in, as the world's uh, leading trading nation. Second reason, its global, global economic interests have in turn created political and security interests abroad. Uh, the BRI project, the, uh, including the investments and in infrastructure, uh, is perhaps the leading example in this case. Its overseas interests also include the safety of several million Chinese workers and tourists abroad. Not so many tourists now during the era of COVID, but before that, there was an enormous number of tourists, as well as large numbers of uh, Chinese workers uh, in Africa and, uh, uh, and elsewhere, often in very dangerous places, I should add. Third, third reason is several of China's most important unresolved security interests are maritime in nature. First is regaining de facto sovereignty over Taiwan. It's the leading uh, of its unresolved security interest and currently is the most dangerous. And we'll be, I'll be talking more about Taiwan shortly. Its security objectives in the South China Sea are also maritime in nature. And, and include evicting what Beijing considers trespassers from the 40-odd Spratly Island features that are occupied by others. Many people don't realize that, there, that China has lots of neighbors down in the Spratlys, Vietnamese, uh, Filipinos, uh, and Malaysians, uh, who have all occupied uh, a number of features throughout the, the Spratly Island chain. But China wants them all to get off of there, and he wants to do it peacefully, uh, and he wants to do it without starting a war. Uh, uh, but in this case, unlike Taiwan, uh, it's China is, I believe, a little more patient, mainly because it is on the island features and that it did, that it occupies, uh, that it has turned them all into bases, and many of them have uh, airfields uh, that can uh, uh, accommodate uh, uh, jet fighters, uh, uh, they're heavy bombers, or not heavy bombers, they're, they're medium range bombers uh, and what have you. So that um, they feel per, that 
they feel that they've put in place the security uh, network necessary uh, to protect the sea lane uh, tra that travels the, through the South China Sea and carries much of uh, China's trade uh, and imports and exports. Finally, being a great maritime power is required to defend China from successful attack from the sea, something the United States has historically demonstrated is uniquely qualified to do. Xi Jinping routinely also brings up uh, the historic memory of the China's century of humiliation. And it is not lost on uh, Chinese that it was triggered by successful attacks from the sea, which incidentally came via the South China Sea. Fourth reason for uh, becoming a great maritime power, growing dependence on raw materials from abroad, oil, coal, iron ore are essential for continued economic expansion. China's food security increasingly depends upon foodstuffs uh, import, uh, imported from abroad. And China's global fishing fleet is an important subset of this point. China has become increasingly dependent upon fish to help satisfy the protein needs of its population. Uh, and interestingly, UN, the UN estimates that China's per capita seafood consumption is something on the order of 90 pounds a year. That's a lot of fish. Fifth reason is the bulk of China's trade and natural resources, as I've suggested, come via uh, ships carrying that trade and carrying those resources to and from China. And protecting those sea lines uh, that, that, that these ships travel on has become a real security uh, anxiety, if you will, for the, for the Chinese. After reading uh, their defense white papers, it's hard to escape the assessment uh, that they really do have a, a, a sea lane anxiety uh, in terms of a country such as the United States, as many uh, uh, commentators have suggested, uh, could interrupt China's ceiling. A sixth reason, even before the People's Republic was established in 1949, the U.S. has maintained a substantial military presence that figuratively is on China's doorstep, a presence that has never served Beijing's interests and for 70 years has postponed the final unification of China and Taiwan. The seventh reason is, uh, if you will, based upon the study of history. In 2006, uh, uh, the party sponsored a study on uh, the historic rise of great powers. It was uh, actually uh, uh, intended for Hu Jintao. The scholarly study concluded that maritime power was a key accelerant in the rise of great power and that China could learn from these historic case studies. And the final reason that China become, it wants to become a, a maritime great power is simply because they can. They have the political go ahead. They are getting lots of green lights from uh, the, uh, standing, uh, the Politburo, uh, the Standing Committee of the Politburo in terms of uh, embracing the, 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 the necessity to become a maritime state. And so it has a political go ahead. It certainly has the money and it certainly has the talented human capital and the infrastructure and a ruthless will to succeed uh, to, uh, is driving the, the maritime power train. Beijing believes that to become a great maritime power, China must possess a powerful Navy because it is a Navy that provides the essential strategic support, that's their term, uh, to the entire maritime power ambition. In short, it is the PLA Navy that is the keystone to the entire Chinese maritime power edifice. The early chapters of the book cover the transition from a Navy that was taking only baby steps toward blue water operations as recently as the early years of this century to one that has become a legitimate blue water expeditionary force today. My favorite example is that it wasn't until 2002, just 18 years ago, before the PLA Navy was bold enough to dispatch a single warship and a supporting tanker on a 123 day, 32,000 nautical mile voyage around the world. This was a PLA Navy first. I say this not to denigrate the fact that it was only 
uh, in the 21st century that this happened, but to highlight how far and how fast the PLA Navy has come in just these 18 years since that uh, uh, groundbreaking uh, uh, global uh, circumnavigation. How did this transformation from a coastally oriented Navy to a globally capable Navy that we see today take place in such a relatively short span of years? First and foremost, as I already emphasized, is ample resources, plus the demand, strategic demand signal that I just ran through in terms of those, and of course the political will aimed at making China a leading world power. But not just these, if you will, uh, macro uh, uh, episode, uh, inspired uh, uh, success, uh, successes, but it also argued that it's now 12 years of continuous anti-piracy deployments, thousands of miles away from China and the far reaches of the Indian Ocean with a key accelerant at the nomadic rise of the PLA Navy. We refer to PLA Navy deployments to the Gulf of, Gulf of Aden as anti-piracy operations, but actually they should be more properly understood as sea lane protection operations. The Chinese Navy is, after all, was sent in 2008 to the Gulf of Aden and is still going there uh, routinely, uh, was in the Gulf to protect Chinese merchant ships that were from piracy uh, that was coming from uh, Somalia. In any event, these operations have been a blue water laboratory for China, where the PLA has learned how to sustain warships on station for many weeks at a time. They've mastered the logistics of, de of uh, deployed support, including underway replenishment, but also the daily routine maintenance and sustainment challenges that anybody who's been to sea and, and been steaming around in the Gulf of Aden or the South China Sea or somewhere else for months at a time recognizes is something that you have to do with when you're on board a, a warship uh, and conducting a mission. It has developed an efficient way to capitalize on the China's state-owned trading and logistics support companies such as Costco not the one around the neighbor, uh, the block, but the Chinese overseas shipping company to handle import supply and other logistics. They have mastered naval diplomacy and show the flag around the world in conjunction with these seven month long deployments. The normal routine is that, uh, in fact, uh, the 37th tax task force just a few days ago left China uh, uh, for uh, the Northern Arabian Sea. Uh, they usually spend about four months on station, five months on station, and then are re uh, replaced by another group coming from China. And the one that has just finished its anti-piracy tour, uh, tour uh, deployment then spends another two and a half or three months traveling around in different parts of the world to make port visits and conduct naval diplomacy. And on total, uh, in total, the deployments that the these task groups have been conducting now for uh, well about 12 years now, uh, last about seven months, uh, portal to portal. So this has meant that China has had to learn how to uh, conduct com uh, command and control of sh ships. But it, the Northern Arabian Sea is about 7,000 miles from China uh, and learn how to organize protection operations uh, and while it was conducting its mission. It's also capitalized and operating in the same waters as ships from the rest of the world's great navies and was able to observe and adapt best practices. Gulf of Aden operations has also been a tre tremendous confidence builder for the PLA Navy and for naval leadership. In 2008, when the first task group was dispatched to the Gulf of Aden, Gulf of Aden no one in Beijing knew for sure how it was going to work out. Would the ships be reliable or would they end up breaking down and spending days in port? Would the sailors be able to perform well during sustained op at sea operation? In short, PA Navy do this without embarrassing itself in China in front of all the navies that were also involved in the anti-piracy operation. As it turned out, none of these problems have occurred. 
the Chinese Navy demonstrated to itself and to its bosses on the Central Military Commission and the Politburo, it could hold its own in this company. This book spends some time uh, on the takeoff in Chinese naval warship uh, procurement that began, the takeoff began just 15 years ago in 2005. Since that time, the PRC has financed the building of enough modern warships, 248 to be precise at my counting, uh, for around 17 commissioned a year or launched a year to create the second most capable Navy in the world. That China is building state of the art warships. When I call them the second most capable Navy in the world, I mean capable in the sense of having substantial numbers of operationally reliable, very well armed, very well equipped modern ships. The Navy is well balanced. By balance, I mean there is a good mix of ship types and submarines designed for different missions. And in fact, in this sense, the PLA Navy is closer to the US Navy in terms of having a balanced naval force structure than any other Navy in the world. Now, of course, we don't know how well they would perform in combat. We do know from Xi Jinping on down, the leadership of China continues to harp at the entire PLA to improve training, to conduct more realistic training, and to learn how to operate in a joint service environment. The, Navy, the Chinese Navy has not been immune from these very high level public criticism. As many of you realize, although it flies a national flag, the PLA Navy's loyalty is to the uh, Chinese Communist Party. Xi Jinping and his subordinates never let them forget this. It's almost the first thing out of his mouth, no matter what the occasion, loyalty to the party. It is a party Navy. It is not a national Navy. The CCP works hard to stamp out any thinking uh, that suggests that the PLA could somehow uh, transition into a national military force. Uh, uh, it is a the armed wing of the CCP and the party and she also continued to reinforce this point. As I suggested, it is also a very big Navy. It is numerically larger than the US Navy. Yes, if you apply the same counting rules that the US Navy uses to count all commissioned ships and auxiliary, auxiliaries, the PLA Navy is the largest Navy in the world today. It has around 340 commissioned ships while using the same counting rules now, mind you, the US Navy is about 296. This is still a bit of a shock. The US Navy, on the other hand, is still the largest in terms of tonnage and has numeric advantages in almost all the major warfare areas such as nuclear powered attack submarines, aircraft carriers, modern air defense destroyers. But the PLA Navy is gaining here as well, especially since 2017, when Xi Jinping set the goal of becoming a world-class force. He wants to have a world-class Navy largely in hand by 2035, just 14 years away. Neither Xi nor other senior officials have defined what world-class means or what they think it means, but world-class carries the connotation of being second to none, being top tier, or being the best in the world. Let me switch now to uh, the PLA Navy's role uh, in China's military or maritime defenses. Uh, China has put in place a, a layered defense concept that the US Department of Defense has characterized as anti-axis and area denial, better known as A2 slant AD. By layered, I mean a uh, combination of missiles, both ballistic and cruise, forward deployed submarine groups, and land-based aircraft with anti-ship cruise missiles form the basis of this layered uh, defense that begins far out at sea, maybe uh, 1,500 miles away uh, from China itself, where ballistic missiles can uh, could attack approaching ships and what have you. The A2 part of A2 AD, anti-axis, what it really comes down to, the easy way to remember it, 
is it means keeping U.S. military reinforcements that might be rushing to East Asia should a war break out over Taiwan or with Japan or some other reason from getting there. In other words, the A2 portion of the strategy is to keep U.S. Uh, forces as far away from China as possible. The AD or the, anti, the area denial portion of this strategy is intended to deal with the U.S. forces that are already in East Asia. And by that, I mean the U.S. 7th Fleet, the U, uh, U.S. 5th Air Force, uh, you and the 3rd Marine Expeditionary Force. These are forces that I call uh, the U.S. first responders. Now, they too are vulnerable to land-based missiles from China, land-based aircraft from China, and Chinese submarines and surface ships. And so uh, while the, the tools that China has to bring to either AD or AD uh, uh, depend upon the, ge the geographic distance from China, uh, the first responders, though, are face the entirety of the in Chinese military. So they are uh, uh, horribly outnumbered and outgunned uh, on a day in and day out basis during during what we would call normal peacetime presence or operations that, that are going on as I speak. Uh, the A2 portion of the campaign that I just mentioned, uh, the, the anti-access portion, has received the most public commentary because of China's capabilities to use ballistic missiles, missiles to target moving ships. Most likely in the Philippine Sea where reinforcements would most likely be approaching China. And they would also have to fight through the Chinese equivalent of submarine wolf pack from the World War II era, the name is. Space surveillance is, in, is absolutely crucial to the entirety of this defense concept I've been talking about. And as a result, because it is essential to it, it is also the Achilles heel of the concept. Because without space-based surveillance, anti-ship ballistic missiles cannot be launched, or they can be launched, but they can't be targeted, I'm, is a better way to put that. Conventionally powered submarines can't be vectored uh, to make the proper intercepts uh, for uh, approaching Navy ships. Remember, conventionally powered submarines do not move at high speeds underwater. So if you don't have a good uh, idea of the location of the uh, enemy ships you're looking for, those submarines can, uh, can uh, be quickly just avoided. And land-based aircraft, similarly, they need a target to be, uh, when you're launched, where are they going to go? Where, where should they expect to find the enemy? Where should they, uh, when, when were they, what range will they be able to locate the enemy uh, to launch their anti-ship cruise missiles? They won't know any of that unless they know where the targets are. So, I, so the obvious conclusion is if we want to, if the United States wants to have a, uh, chance to effectively reinforce, if you will, a, a conflict uh, that breaks out over Taiwan, then the thing that has to be done is China's surveillance system has to be made not to work. Taiwan is an important topic of this book, as I've suggested, because it's the most credible friction point in East Asia that can involve the United States in a war with China. The book looks into the central role the Chinese Navy plays in the Taiwan campaign. Uh, obviously, if, if there's going to be an invasion, it's the Navy's job to get the, the army to Taiwan. But it has many other things it has to worry about, dealing with, with uh, U.S. or uh, submarines or potentially Japanese submarines that could be uh, fighting on the side of Taiwan. It has to be involved in providing air defense from land-based uh, U.S. land-based aircraft or Japanese land-based aircraft, et cetera. The, in looking at the Taiwan campaign, the U.S. I just mentioned that the U.S. Seventh Fleet first responders, Fifth Air Force, and what have you, face the entirety of its military establishment. 
it also, the book also goes into a tough question that uh, Beijing is going to have to face. And I'm sure they've thought about this and worm game this a million times, but U.S. land-based air power uh, in Asia is all stationed, well, with the exception of South Korea, is all stationed in Japan. A lot of it in Okinawa, a lot of it in uh, Iwakuni. So if the prerequisite for an amphibious assault is, is air superiority. So if China has to achieve air superiority over the Taiwan Strait, will it attack U.S. Air Force, U.S. Marine Corps Air stationed in, uh, in Kadena or, uh, or uh, Iwakuni? Uh, on Japanese soil and potentially bring Japan into the war? Or will they not? So, but that's a tough decision they're going to have to come to grips with. In the book, to, to, in other words, to play out the, the scenario, I say that, uh, that China would uh, conduct an attack on these facilities. Um, but it's a, as I say, it, Widening the war would be a very difficult problem, a difficult political and uh, diplomatic problem that China would have to face if it intends to use force. Because of the potential threat uh, to China's sea lanes uh, posed that, that cross both the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean, the book has chapters that both address this particular issue. In, this, in the Indian Ocean, uh, the potential threat by India to China's sea lanes across the, uh, uh, is a, rea a reality, plus the fact that uh, there's U.S. presence in the Indian Ocean uh, in the uh, form of the U.S. Fifth Fleet in, uh, in, the, in and around the Persian Gulf. But talking about the Indian Ocean is, brings up really an important point, which is that when the Chinese Navy sails out from underneath its land-based air and missile umbrella, when it loses this air cover, it becomes very, very vulnerable, especially in the Indian Ocean where it faces Indian aircraft and Australian aircraft and U.S. aircraft or potential aircraft bases there. It has Now, China is well aware of this shortcoming, and that's why it's building aircraft carriers. And, it's, and so it can bring its own care, air cover along if it go when it operates in the Indian Ocean. It has a long road to travel in this regard. They have the hulls. They have two commissioned two ships, two aircraft carriers now, and a third is, is uh, building and expected uh, uh, to be commissioned sometime in 2021. Uh, but they have yet to field a decent aircraft. I mean, after all, the reason for having an aircraft carrier is so you can fly airplanes off of it. They have, they have the J-15 Flying Shark that they use uh, on their carriers right now, but there's only 24 of them in, the, in, in uh, Navy inventory. That's not enough to fill the air wing of the, on both the two carriers that they already own. Uh, and so what they're doing is trying to develop or bringing on board a new aircraft. And so until the Chinese uh, Navy accepts and, and is able to uh, adapt a new aircraft to its aircraft carrier force, they have very little limited and very limited capability. In the South China Sea chapter, uh, I've already mentioned some of that, that the, 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 the line of bases that, that stretch from the Spratly Islands through the Paracel Islands to Hainan uh, are, are militarized. Uh, and provide a very uh, interlocking uh, bases that uh, can cover uh, through air power uh, the entire South China Sea and, and much of the littoral states uh, there. Uh, and so their accumulation of, of uh, features has yielded this, this ability to prevent, to, to uh, protect not only uh, a maritime advance via the South China Sea, but also protect their sea line that runs from Malacca to China, which happens to be about 1,100 miles. It's a long sea line. Now let me turn to the final chapter and get uh, and get to our here. I return to the broader concept of maritime power, 
because the more I dug into the maritime power goal, I came to realize that when the objective was announced in 2012, China was not starting with a clean sheet of paper. This was not some bolt out of the blue aspiration. Rather, China already was a maritime power at the time and remains one today. It was and is a global leader in shipbuilding. It was and has today still the largest merchant marine. Some 5,000 merchant ships are owned by Chinese. It has the largest Coast Guard, some 250 ocean-going cutters, and far and away the largest fishing fleet, well over somewhere between 200 to 300,000, uh, with about 4,000 of them, of those who can go anywhere in the world to fish, distant water fishing ships that can go to South America, off the coast of East or West Africa, uh, and catch fish. And finally, of course, uh, it is uh, the, among the world's great navies. I conclude the book by looking into what did Xi Jinping mean by world-class navy? What, what would a world-class navy look like? We know it would be big, but how big? We don't know because China warship, China's warship building goals are remain a state secret, unlike every other country in the world that announces how many ships of what kind they're going to build. Will it operate a sizable naval task forces abroad on a routine basis the way the US Navy does in, when it becomes this world-class Navy? I predict it will, but this is only a prediction. Or will it remain operationally focused uh, in just in Asia uh, with only modestly sized formations active overseas. And how big will it be? My conclusion that is that in 2035, uh, the PLA Navy will be about a size of 425 ships. 265 of those are what I would call blue water ships. It can go anywhere in the world, can operate and stay for for long periods of time, where another 160 or smaller, they carry fewer, uh, a smaller crew, uh, uh, less fuel, et cetera, who are mainly suited for operations in and around the first island chain. So that's a 425 ship force. It will have a global expeditionary capability mimicking the United States. A Navy this size will certainly be world class. Let me finish by one final comment. Because a focus on simply the PLA Navy would present an incomplete and unbalanced picture of the totality of China's coercive maritime power, the book also includes two very well done appendices, one on the Chinese Coast Guard and one on China's maritime militia written by, at my request by America's leading experts on those subjects, Ryan Martinson, uh, Andrew Erickson and Connor Kennedy, all of the Naval War College. And with that, I'm looking forward to your questions. Mike, thanks so much. That was uh, very interesting and very clear. Thank you.